All right. Um, well, let's kick off, shall we? Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Now, I welcome uh, Mr. Gordon McKinlay of McKinlay Transport. So, for the Hansard record, if you could please give your name and the capacity in which you appear today. Okay. I'm uh, uh, Gordon McKinlay, as you said, from McKinlay Transport in Holbrook, and a uh, small family transport company. I'm also the president of the National Road Freighters Association, and um, yeah, try and keep myself uh, fairly actively involved in making this great industry greater. Good on you, thanks. And um, I'm, this may sound uh, breaking from tradition, but Gordo, thanks, mate. And just for the record, I've been working closely with Gordon and the National Road Freighters Association since you invited me up to your national um, annual Con AGM yeah. conference there last year. So, Gordo, let's fire away, mate. You've seen, you know how this works. This is your opening statement, mate, and this is your opportunity on behalf of your organisation and all the trucking industry to give us the whole story, warts and all, mate. Okay, um, thanks. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, particularly Glenn, for um, driving this and uh, making this happen. Uh, the road transport industry is a fantastic industry that is, uh, I believe, should be considered the same as power, water and sewerage, uh, an essential service, because without it, we would have nothing. We would be sitting on a piece of grass here a couple of stories below where we are all butt naked freezing cold because at the end of the day there's an old saying uh, the only thing not delivered by a truck is a baby and we are an essential service we're unfortunately not recognized like that we're not treated as such um and you, you sort of start to wonder you know why it, it, you probably listen to everything today and we wonder why the hell anyone would want to have anything to do with this industry and that's actually a really good question because we're getting to the point where we're finding it very very hard to get people involved um my son my oldest son is 24 today and he is involved in the transport industry he's uh, followed me into it and uh you know, he's a very rare breed, and unfortunately we need many, many young people like that to get involved, and um, it's just not happening. The age, the average age of, of truck drivers is getting ever uh, increasing at a steadily, steady rate, and if it gets to the point where we, we can't fill seats, remember that this is an essential service, and if we can't put drivers in trucks, what will we do? You know, if it's no different than if we the fuel supply in Australia was to run out and we couldn't put fuel in the trucks, what would we do? Well, it's no different if if you can't put someone in the driver's seat. Um, I don't think that uh, driverless trucks are the uh, are the, are the, the the cure. Um, I think driver driverless trucks may be a band aid fix to a problem that exists because we have other problems in the industry that uh, are keeping people out of the industry. I would love to see um, the, the government say, you know what, we're, we're not going to have driverless trucks. What we're actually going to do is make, a, a, we're, going to, we're not going to put people out of work. We're going to actually make these industries uh, fun and enjoyable and rewarding to be part of. And we're going to try and get people to come in and be a part of that and this is how we're going to do it. We're not going to put a band-aid over it and say, well, we, you know, we can't get anyone stupid enough to come and drive a truck, so we're going to put a, a computer in it that will control it. That, that's sort of something I wasn't even sort of thinking, talking about, but it, it has just come along. Um, I've got uh, a few issues that I probably want to raise. I could talk for three weeks and I could talk about the love of the industry and I could also talk about the things that we really need to do to help us out and fix it up. And I think if you look en masse, truck drivers do this job as a passion and, and, it, and it comes at a, at a high cost. Um, it can, it can uh, take your family away. It, it's, a, it's a very hard thing that, that people do and they do it for some crazy reason. They're passionate about it and, and, and I really don't know what it is because when you have that, you have that and, and you... You can't explain it to someone, and I often say to people, "If I've got to explain that, well, you're never going to understand." So, and and that's pretty right. So, I think a few of the issues that, that I'd like to uh, I'll, I'll go through, and you've been very generous with your time, so I, I should have a bit of time to get through them. One of the biggest things I think at the moment is the uh, is the the rates or. Um, the remuneration that we receive to to operate a vehicle and. 
I, my history in, in the last uh, well, three years ago, I fought vehemently against the um, the uh, road safety remuneration tribunal. I was um, led a campaign to that to have that uh, abolished, and I didn't have that. I didn't partake in that because I thought it was a crazy idea to pay people a minimum rate. It was because of the the nuts and the bolts of that particular legislation. And I'm not going to go into that. We all have our our views on that and, and whatever. But the actual idea of it, I still remember when I first uh, read about that, I uh, I thought, gee, that's a great idea, you know, actually recognising what, it, what we should be getting paid a minimum to do a job. I think getting back to the fact that, that I believe we're an essential service, we need to be remunerated as such. So... And I think it can also come into the... We've got this the chain of responsibility law at the moment. And to be honest, from my point of view, as an operator, the, the chain of responsibility has, if anything, put more pressure on us because we are now... It seems like everyone above the truck driver, and when I say above, I don't mean that they're, they're better than us or anything like that, but in, in the chain above us that happens before the pallet lands on the dock... They all, you know, carry out a butt covering exercise and handball it down the chain. And at the end of the day, we're the poor bugger at the end of it. And, and we are the ones that we don't get a lot of say. And, and as Rod pointed out before me, um, you know, you, you've got to be very careful what you say and who you say it to because, you know, someone else will be sitting there waiting to do the work. And, uh, you know, that can be pretty, pretty frustrating. Um, can so, I just, sorry, Gordon, can I just explore a bit more about the more important thing? And it's warts and all. Yep. You know, and, and this is the beauty of our industry. People tell us what they're thinking, even if we don't want to know. But yep. this is what makes it so special. But let's follow that a little bit more because it seems to be in the transport industry. And you are uh, at the coalface and you represent uh, a heck of a lot of uh, drivers and small businesses out there as your role with the NRFA. But what is wrong with having a cost recovery? This is the yeah. first thing. So how would you see now the RSRT, and we, we've all had these conversations, and you and I and thousands of others, we want to move forward. Yeah. But not only do we want, we're not whinging about it, we want to fix it. Yeah. How would you see that we could, government, actually involve ourselves? Instead of keeping our hands, and I'm talking all governments from all levels, can't wait to put their fingers into the pockets of the hardworking men and women in the transport industry. Well, it's time now. How can they fix it for us, mate? What, what do we like? I think we could use the chain of responsibility, for example, in in our favour. So, um, you know, under the chain of responsibility, I have to, you know, I have to tick all the boxes and make sure that you know that everything I'm doing is safe and I'm compliant and whatever. And the one thing that is not involved in that is, at the end of the day, I mean, I'm sure. We, we all go to work for a different reason and, you know, I'm sure particularly in your case, Glenn, what you do is you're obviously very passionate about it and you enjoy what you do. But at the end of the day, we go for one reason to work and that's to put money in the bank so that we can live and that's that's why we do it. I don't know why it, it seems to be such a crime as a as, as a, an operator of, of heavy vehicles that you, it's almost, you know, if you're making a profit, my God, you know, that's just, phew, heaven forbid. You know, someone should be getting that money, not you, you know. Now, under the chain of responsibility, we have to, you know, say, yep, we've got, you know, the, the indicators work, the headlights work, you know, the tyres are safe, the, the vehicle's roadworthy, the driver's had his rest, um, you know, all the different bits and pieces, but no one ever says, oh, now, the reason you come to work is to earn a living. Are you earning a living? No one says, is the rate that, you know, Joe Citizen is paying you to cut uh, your full load of freight for him to, from, from uh, Sydney to Melbourne, you know, are you able to do that and make a profit? Um, why, why do you cut? I've, I've, I've got a customer that, uh, and a good customer, and I work for and I cut freight both ways for them. Uh, so from, from Sydney to Melbourne, uh, for example, you might get um, you might get well. I'll, I'll use some I'll use some figures. I'll give you some real world figures. So, sure. not this particular customer is probably he's one of my better ones. I'll use another example. So another customer that I do work for, you might get fifteen hundred dollars plus GST to cart 
25 tonnes from Melbourne to Sydney, which isn't really enough money anyway. It, you know, I, I think to, to run a, a heap, like a semi-trailer, pay the wages and do everything else, you need at least $2 a kilometre to do it. It's 900 kilometres, so it should be $1,800 plus GST. That's my opinion. I, I could be wrong. But when you turn around to come from Sydney to Melbourne, and as I've said to Glenn before, on the map it's actually downhill, but in reality it's not. It's exactly the same distance. You, should, you use the same amount of fuel. You'll get, you know, there's people out there that will do it for $900, $1,000. You know, your, your truck is using over 50 cents a litre in, in fuel per kilometre. Your driver's costing you, by the time you do um, his wages and his superannuation, workers' compensation, everything, he's costing you probably close to 60 cents a kilometre. So it's costing you, you know, before you even put an oil filter on the truck or replace a tyre or repair the damage from the wombat that walked out in front of you last night, sure. you're 20 cents in the in the red before you start. For every kilometre you do. So the harder you work, yeah. more kilometres you drive, the quicker you're going to go broke. That's great. What a fantastic industry. So we need to... Have, now, I hear people say backload. What a load of rubbish. If backload doesn't, should not exist. So I, I would like to, under chain of responsibility, the people that are, that are moving freight in different areas, I believe they need to be accountable for what it's costing you to operate and there needs to be a, a profit margin and you need to be able to replace equipment. These trucks are expensive. $350,000 for a new prime mover nowadays... That's a pretty decent house where I come from. Three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Then you go and throw another. If you've got one trailer, you know another seventy or eighty thousand dollars. So you're up around. You're very very close to half a million dollars. And you can, and I don't know how blokes that buy new trucks do it. I mean, I I'm a mechanic myself. I look after my own gear, and uh, and and I struggled to do it with old equipment that was a fraction of that cost. Um, you know, we've then we've got pressure. I've had, I've heard of, you know, pressure from the, the government side where they're saying, well, you know, we want to, uh, the, the, another problem we've got, not only is the, the age of the truck driver getting up, up there, he's getting older every year, the age of the national fleet is also getting older, you know, and now I love old trucks, I think they're great, nothing better than an old truck's done a couple of million kilo, you know, kilometres and it's been maintained well. It gives you great pride to to say, you know, look, my truck's done two million kilometres and it's it still passes a roadworthy. It's safe. To me, that's that's green. It's looking after the environment because I'm not. I've got this huge uh, environmental footprint to have a new truck manufactured. I'm I'm getting the most out of this old one. They're generally better on fuel than the new ones. Right. So I don't have a problem with older trucks. I don't have a problem with newer trucks. If you put new people want to drive a new truck, that's great. But you should be able to get the money back from that investment. You know, you're looking at half a million dollar investment. That's if, you know, go down the path of a, a, a new prime mover, a B-double fridge van set, you're looking at maybe $700,000. That is a huge investment and you cannot get the money back from that investment. So where is the people in the chain that, where is their responsibility to be accountable to pay what is right, not, oh, you know, Joe Boggs will do it for me for, for $900, so I'm going to go with that. Well, you know what, you need to go to jail for 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 making that deal happen. That deal should be illegal. Good, let's, 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 let's dig in a bit further and explore this. And, and those that are uninitiated could say very clearly to you, well, instead of doing it for 1500 why don't you do it for 1800 Lay it all out on the table for us, mate. Exactly what happened. So if, if, if I if I do it for eighteen hundred, if I say to the bloke, look, you know, I need eighteen hundred dollars to do that, he'll go, yep, no drama. He springs the next bloke. Yep. You know, so I'm no longer, and and this is where I've I've always provided a very good service, and I would like to get my work based on how my service is, not what my invoice is. You know, so I, I would like. The, the point where you know you've got to sit down with the customer and and you know it can be quite easy it can be a, a form with a simple mathematic equation it takes into account the price of fuel at the moment fuel has varied in the time i've owned i've owned trucks now for and i'll, I'll just put in a bit of a disclosure here because there may be people that that 
do or don't like me. I actually don't own a truck at the moment. I own two trailers. I have one tow hauler on at the moment and I'm in between tow haulers. So what that is, I have a gentleman that, he was actually my driver and he bought my old truck and he now tows my trailer. I organise the freight and he works direct for us. So that's how we, we do it. Um, so just so that everyone is on 100% honest with my situation at the moment, you might say, well, why don't you own a truck? I don't own a truck anymore because... It was, I was going backwards. I could not afford to have a driver in that truck and pay him everything he, that was entitled to and make a, 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 a profit. We blew an engine in that truck uh, earlier this year and the best part of $40,000 spent to get that truck back on the road and it just, that, that comes straight out of your, 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 your family, basically. But you sure, know. with your role as the president of the NRFA, I mean, you would be inundated daily with these stories yeah, where, it, where people are being undercut, undercut and undercut. I so, could go through my yeah. phone here, Glenn, give yeah. you, give you uh, countless numbers to ring of operators that, that are in exactly the same boat. You know, my desk and, is full of them. Yeah. yeah. And look, some of them aren't great business people. Don't get me wrong. And therein lies probably another problem. You can, you can, you can go out, you can, you can, well, a great example, you can get on the, on the 747 and come over from another country, get the international driver's license, as we've just pointed out previously with Rod, get your license. If someone will fund you, you can buy a, a truck and start to operate and you've got no, you may not even know how the GST system works, for example. You don't know, you don't have to have any, licensing to say that you you know what you, you you're doing now another example when it comes to, to the licensing thing um, we constantly every person we do work for wants every single piece of information we have they want our you know our workers compensation forms we want, you know you, you're looking for work and you can be in Timbuktu in your truck and you, you find someone that, yep, got a load for you from Timbuktu to, you know, the middle of nowhere, so you take it, whatever. Then you've got to supply all this insurance stuff and all the rest of it. I don't have a problem with that, but let's just do it bloody well once. Yeah. Let's have a, a thing where I go to the government and I say, here you go, here's my stuff. You give me a registration number just like you bolt on the front of the truck. And when someone, you know, says to me, okay, I need you, uh, instead of saying to me, I need you to send me a 15-page fax from your truck when you're in Timbuktu and you don't have access to 3G, and you say, yeah, I'll quote you my number, mate. You get on the, you get on the national server and you number such, 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 bang, that comes up, McKinley Transport, yep, he's qualified, he's certified to do this, this, this and this. How easy would that be? So that was something that I asked Nat Road about, uh, three years ago and you know that we, we joined a, a committee there to, to try and make a, a change and, and nothing came of that and uh, which was a big letdown and uh, that, that was you know that was a, I just think we could simplify things you know that's another thing that puts pressure on us we have to do all this compliance stuff it's over the top we all want to be safe you know mm -hmm. I love my family I want to go home and see them you know are you saying you've got to do a different workers' comp form for every for, so, who drives a truck? Can you just no, for, so for any different customer that I have, and they some people are pretty casual, and you, know, you just turn up and cart the freight, send them a bill, and you get paid. That's yeah. great. Some of them, like for example, I've got one at the moment. Now, I've carted the, the load for him, and I'm like hopefully getting a phone call from him today saying he's got something for me today. I've still got a truck in Sydney without a load today. Yeah. That customer, you know, he said, oh, you haven't done a load for us for, you know, 12 months. Um, you need to update your, um, you know, your insurance things and that. And it's like, and I'm busy, right? You know, yep. so I'm like, yep, 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 I'll get to it, I'll get to it. And that's not my forte, I've got to tell you, I, you yep. know. But I've then got to, at night, I'll, I'll get in the office and find all this stuff and, and send it through and all that. And then the next bloke wants it. And then the next bloke wants it. And then the next bloke wants it. There's a big company that I drive for, one of the multinational, uh, that, sorry, that we can't freight for, one of the multinationals, who I might point out at the moment, and you've all got vehicles, I presume, so most of you would have purchased fuel in the last mm. year or so. Fuel hasn't gotten much cheaper, has it? No. This multinational company is still charging us a negative fuel rate, a, a negative a negative fuel um, 
levy. Ex explain to us what that So they what say, we're going to give you, you know, X amount of dollars to cart that freight from point A to point B. And some places give you a... And I'll be honest with you, I don't know of anyone that I work for that gives you a fuel uh, rebate. Uh, uh, okay. Rise so, and fall. The rise and fall rebate. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. So there should be... So you, you need to work out, okay, this is your base rate. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, you know, I've got a, a figure that I've worked out in my head how it would work. You, you, if you had a single, uh, single trailer on the east coast, and this is something we need to take into account, if we go down the path of, of regulating the price, Australia is a very big place, we have very diverse gear, and we do very diverse work. I'm, I'm not here to tell you that, you know, this is the, the equation, because it's very hard to work out. And, and I... That's right. We, we had a meeting uh, in Rockhampton recently with uh, Scott Buckholz and this was raised with him and we then had a committee meeting after that and uh, we all sat down and we actually tried to work out how you would do it and let me tell you, it's not easy, you no, know, and I'm not saying it is, but it is something we need to do. Can I, sorry, if, if I can say that, right, Gordo, can I come back and, and I think, not for the transport fraternity, we know exactly how it works, but when we have, and this is pretty easy, most of us, I keep saying us, most of you, you all purchase fuel around the same price. Yep. You all purchase the trucks around the same price to be at fleets. Get, you know, yep. So let's go through that because when the top of the supply chain starts squeezing down, yep. because when all is said and done, and I hate this term, but, but you and, and when I was there too, we are price takers. Yeah, exactly. Okay, we're, we're the bottom of the food chain yep. and, and that's really terrible. So... When the rate goes below the cost recovery, you can't tell Shell to go to bugger in because mm. we're not going to pay you the full rate. You can't tell your insurance company I'm not. Pay. What gives? That's no. my my luck. So where do we squeeze the dollars to cover our fixed cost and our operating costs? Where does it come from, mate? It comes from our profit margin, if there if there ever was one. And then that, and then you know, it means that you. It not only has an effect on us, it has an effect on the whole community because, you know, if we're, if we're profitable, we'll put money back into the community. You know, we'll, we'll go and we do things. We'll, you might sponsor something or you buy, you know, your tyres locally or whatever. And, and, you know, like instead of having to go and hunt down a set of tyres in Brisbane because you're up there and they're $40 cheaper each because you're that tight on your money, you can actually go down to the bloke in your local town and, uh, and and buy them off him and not even ask him what the price is because he needs to make a dollar and you need to make a dollar and everyone's making a dollar and it's all great and you just pay the bill and be done with it. But now things are so tight. Um, I, just, I was telling Glenn uh, earlier, uh, I had one of our, uh, a, a rep came in that, a parts rep that I deal with once a week. He came in yesterday and he was telling me about a transport company locally that was purchasing uh, a particular part. And uh, he, and, and like this, this, this is a part that's going on a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar prime mover. And the part was a you know seven hundred and something dollar part. And he's quibbled over ten or twenty dollars on this part. You know, and and yes, he probably is that sort of bloke there, but. That's how tight things are. You know, bikes are out there where on a $350,000 truck, $20 matters. You know, and it shouldn't be that way. You should be able to just pay that bloke who's trying to make a living out of selling the parts what he needs to get for the parts. You but know. It's come back, Gordo, a lot of this stuff, and your members uh, talk about this all the time, as, as I do with everyone, that um, um, uh, this squeeze comes down to drivers' wages. And there is the old, uh, with me, with my old union hat on, was, oh, well, it's all the boss's fault, which couldn't be further from the yeah. truth with the majority of transport yeah. employers. So when we have, and this is why my huge bugbear, when everyone, we used to, when there was a set standard and there was an enforceable award minimum rate, everyone competed on the same level playing field and it got down the service or who you know and who you didn't know, or whatever it was. But now I've got examples and I'd be interested to know how you go, Gordo, because you've got reliable driver or two that you in, you employ yeah. and you value them as part of your family yeah. as all of our most of our most of our operators do but when you're tendering work because your driver is to be paid a minimum standard what message does it send back to the transport community when there are um, drivers driving for other drivers 
who two, three, four, five dollars an, uh, an hour, and I'm not yeah. making this stuff up, Senator Rennick, this is true. Tell us the effect that has, mate, because what well, are you doing? Well, it means that us blokes that are trying to do our mm. thing, right? So I put a driver on recently who, and he ended up buying the truck off me now, and he's my tow hauler now, which is great because it's it's more comfortable for me to, to do that because I, I just couldn't, I couldn't make a dollar out of the truck while I <coughs> was paying him as a driver. Um, and uh, so... He said to me when the first paycheck he got from me, he said, "Wow, I've, I've never never been so paid so well." This is like he was shocked, and I said, "Mate, you've been paid properly. You know, I'm paying you what the the rate is, you know." And the rate, the minimum. Yeah, and and, and so yeah. there's an old thing. There's a, a lot of people in the in the uh, industry, and some of them are going to come into this room today and sit here and talk to you. I'll I'll tell you right now, some of the bigger players, and I'll tell you now, I know for a fact I've worked with some. They're going to come in this room and they're going, to, they're going to have problems as well. I can tell you that they pay their drivers the wage then they take the overnights. Rod was talking about overnights there earlier on. So they take um, the, the driver's overnight allowance. They will take that out of the driver's wage and then tax the driver. So the driver pays less tax and then they put that back in tax-free, which is, in my eyes, theft. Theft. Nothing short of it. Let's not mix words. That is stealing from the driver. Whereas I would do it the right way. I would pay the driver what he was owed, and then I would pay the overnight out of my pocket because that's it. that's that's what he, that's how it should be done. So I'm competing against the people that are doing that. You know, they're 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 knocking money off from their drivers every day to prop their business up, and I have to compete against that as a, as an operator. And that I'll tell you what the result is, Glenn. I sold the trucks. Mm, that's sure. what the result is. That's yeah. why I didn't sell trucks because I don't love trucks anymore. I didn't sell trucks because I don't want to be in transport anymore. I still am in transport. Um, I, I sold them because the, the, the two things that were very hard to to control the cost of was fuel and the driver. If you, you have a tow hauler, for example, instead of an employed driver, um, you know, and he's, he's gaining an asset. He wanted to do it. He, he bought the vehicle. He wanted to go down that path. I was happy to sell it to him. And... I then no longer, if he wants to drive flat out and burn fuel like it's going out of fashion, it comes out of his pocket, not mine. Um, you know, he's, it's his, he covers his wages and all that, you know. They're the things that don't get fixed up. Now, every year the, the wages go up, every year fuel goes up. Fuel's buried 50 cents a litre in the time I've had trucks. I've had trucks seven years. I'll give you an idea, so I, 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 I a single semi trailer running Sydney to Melbourne, we're just gonna say look for, for round for round figures, um, let's say uh, it, it's getting two point two kilometres per litre. Um, it's going to do about two hundred and twenty thousand kilometres a year. So as a pretty simple equation, he's gonna burn a hundred thousand litres of fuel for the year. So every litre of fuel every time fuel goes up one cent <coughs> per litre that is a thousand dollars a year that costs you, or, or it varies. So it might be up or down. It can vary. So, as the, so you think when you fill your Camry up, you think, yeah, that's right. Just one truck makes a big difference. When you go and fill a truck up, mm -hmm. it's a, a massive, massive difference. Um, and so, it's a thousand dollars per uh, per a thousand dollars a year per cent. Yeah. So, no, so let's put this in perspective. Fuel has varied. 50 cents in the seven years that I've had I've paid down to 99 cents a litre I was cheering mm. and I've paid you know more than that actually because it's now about $1.55 or whatever so that, let's just call it 50 cents that means that is that is taken $50,000 out of the out, straight out of the bottom line of that truck now how much do you think I got paid extra for that yeah. Nothing. Yes, probably told not sharpen, a cent. Probably told to sharpen your pencil. Exactly. Now we've got major, major, uh, you know, national carriers that are screwing blokes like me, and they at the moment got a negative fuel surcharge. Can you believe it? So they're saying to us, what they're effectively saying is, fuel's so cheap at the moment, you can do this job so cheap, we can actually take some of your money off you, and we'll keep it. I don't know how that works, and that that yeah. should be criminal. Well, because there's well, no that's similar to the step down in the dairy industry, isn't it? I mean, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. No, if the pro that's that's your that's your um, 
you know, when you set that price for however long you're going to do a deal for, if the price, yeah. the price petrol goes down, well, that's, you know, that's in your pocket. That should be in your pocket. So I, I, back of the envelope figure that I've, uh, that I've worked on, um, it, it worked out in my head, um, is I believe uh, we should be paid about $2 a kilometre based on a fuel, uh, like so this, this should be quite an easy way to get a, a, a national fuel gate price. It's, it's, it's available and it can be an east coast, west coast thing, whatever, regional, I don't know, whatever. But let's call it, um, you know, so I, I think a truck should make $2 a kilometre, a single trailer should make $2 a kilometre at a dollar a litre. So, and then for every cent uh, that the fuel goes up, I've worked this out myself and I might be stupid, but I reckon half a cent per, um, for every, for every cent that fuel has gone up, you need to add half a cent to your kilometre rate. That's can how I, I work it can out. Can I just chuck in there, go to Senator Rennick, if I may, and I know, that going back to my previous life as an organiser of the TW and WA, yep. after my trucking career finished, yep. um, I have absolutely no problem with honesty and accountability, and that's the way it is. And I have absolutely no problem, because we, we did implement in a number of yards yep. uh, fuel levies. Yep. That only works if the base rate is correct. Yep. And this yep. is the problem, correct me if I'm wrong, Gordo, with your NRFA hat on, the base rate is nowhere near where the base rate no, should be. Some no. operators are earning a good and good yep. luck to them. Yep. So before we sort of transgress into that yep. argument, yep. we're miles from that. Yeah. That's so right. so put your NRFA hat on, mate, and yep. come back to us on this. And 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 I really struggle because while we have fleets and major companies who will be appearing yep. and who are supporting the inquiry or from the uh, transport industry standards forum. Um, would it not be for your members, Gordo, both owner drivers and small and medium enterprises, we have a basic law in this land which is called the modern award. Yep. And I'm sure that the majority of transport operators would love to pay the modern oh, award yeah. and some. Yeah. No yeah. argument. But we have no enforcement of the modern award yep. through Fair Work or anyone. No, we What's don't. the conversation around your membership? that um, they would love to pay that, but they can't get it out of the employers? Or, or am I just making this up? Well, I think... That, that, there, yeah, yeah, I think we most people would... Uh, well, one of sorry, our members... Sorry, mate, when I say the employers, the yeah. economic employers, I, I, I was, top of the chart. Yeah, sorry. I was about to say it. So um, a lot of our members are actually probably owner drivers and, and single vehicle fleet, so that's the first thing. So a lot of them are working for themselves, but... At the end of the day, you know, it doesn't matter whether you own the truck or you're putting someone else in to drive it. That truck should pay whoever's driving it fully with a profit margin. If that's you, that's great. If it's Joe Bloggs driving it for you, no dramas, you know. So I think there, there is definitely uh, a feeling that, you know, it's very, very hard to... Well, there's just there's, no, there's nothing left. The tank is empty. And we're at crisis point. Like, don't get me wrong... Mm-hmm. How many how many people are going out of this business now? They're just. I'm lucky. I I, I got out like and, and sold my trucks without going broke. But you know, if I had have been, you know, crazy and and just tried to ride it out and and put the blinkers on and say this is going to work itself out, it's not. This is how we're going to work it out. Doing stuff like this today here now, not by driving from Sydney to Melbourne for nothing. Would there be an appetite for your membership um, uh, to have some form of enforcement? I know you said chain of responsibility, yeah. but chain of responsibility, in my own opinion, won't sort out the basic minimum laws of the land yeah. where I believe, and I want your feedback here from your membership too, mate, I believe that government, government needs to extract a digit. Yep. And it's all very well for the Fair Work Commission and good on them yep. to go off and chase, you know, strawberry farm you know, yep. farmers or whatever. Yep. But we have this massive part of our economy, the transport, the road transport sector, which I'm told contributes somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of GDP. But I'll be corrected on yep. that. Hundreds of thousands of men and women engaged in it, yep. but we have nowhere to go to say, can someone please? tell the mining companies, the retail companies, the manufacturer, whoever it may be, that you cannot continue to mm. cut the operating costs because there is um, um, wages and conditions yeah. by law that must be met. What's yeah. the membership's view on that, mate? 
Um, well, I think the, the membership definitely a, a, agrees that there's a that there is nothing, and I and I think I've brought it up with several members, um, and uh, you know, if if we can't, uh, what's the right way to say it? The we just can't keep getting squeezed. The, the, we, we're now out of juice. The, the orange yep. is, is squeezed dry, you know. And I think the, the members are now sort of starting to ask, well, what, what can we do? And, and I think some of them are saying this chain of responsibility, why can't this be our saviour? Why can't the chain of responsibility go all the way to the top of the chain where, um, where, where the people that are trying to move the freight are responsible that the person at the end of the chain, there might be five transport companies involved in that too. Now, that's the other thing. Yeah. You know, uh, John Smith might want to move a load of apples from Batlow to Sydney Market and then he, he talks to this transport company and he can't do it because all his trucks are busy carting things and so he gives it to this bloke and then he gives it yeah. to this bloke. And by the time it gets down to the old Fred who actually jumps in the truck and carts the freight to market... There's nothing left because they've all taken their percentage out, and mm. it's, you know. Yeah. So, should the person at the top of the chain under responsibility, he has got a, he should have a legal obligation to this bloke who actually carted the apples to the market, yeah, to make sure that he's done that with enough money to run profitably, safely. And you know, economically viably. And and I have no argument because I think I mean, we've been talking chain of responsibility for nearly twenty five years or something. You know, yep. banging the head against a brick wall on chain of responsibility, yep. and then they now tell me there's been three or four prosecutions finally. Yep. But would there not be the the need would be Gordo that there should be an agency, a government agency, which we've got yep. that doesn't wait for crooked chefs to get caught. Yeah. Or woolies to self-confess they've had a computer glitch or bunnings. Mm. That should actually would it be would it be reasonable uh, for your members to support that? Hang on, fair work, fun, fair work. Get out there if there is and, and audit and check. And if there is massive underpayment, which we know there is, yeah. of the modern award payments, don't go for the owner of the truck. Yeah. Don't go for the poor bugger who's getting the living nights to go to then flick it over to the chain of responsibility. Yeah. Would that not be a far more yeah, I, I think, constructive way of doing it, do you think? I think so, and I think that the, the chain of responsibility needs to be used, and it needs to be, um, it needs to be charted in a manner that it starts to look at where the real problem is. And the real problem isn't actually with us. We are the victims as much as anything in, yeah. in that. Um, yeah, you know, I think that that definitely, definitely, you know, we, we've got a. Surely, there's a simple contract of carriage or something that you you need to fill out before you do a load, and in that have very visible. You know, my fueling rate is this much. The fuel economy of the vehicle is this much. The cents per kilometre for uh, repairs, maintenance, and replacement of the truck is this much, and you have everything itemised down, so the customer can see it, and then you then, you know, and, and they can be very... That doesn't have to be something that I work out myself. Surely that's something that we've got enough, um, you know, Bureau of Statistics and all the rest of it right. can sit down and work out that for a, um, you know, for a 22-wheel uh, single prime mover and trail combination running east coast of, of Australia, it costs this much per kilometre to, to run it. And then fuel... Yeah, the mean fuel price at the for this week, and do it on a seven-day cycle. It doesn't have to be every day. Just do it on a seven-day cycle. Is this much? So you, when you get the, the person rings up and says, "Yep, I want to want you to cart the freight," you go right. We've got the distance is GPS. I can go. That's the address, and that's the address. It's 877 kilometres, and it's going to burn this much fuel. Tolls. We've got toll roads. It's nothing yeah. to spend four hundred dollars a week in tolls. You get nothing for it. Add all that in. All that has to come into account. 
that's how much it's going to cost to do the job. For me to do it safely and economically viably, that's what it's going to cost. And it's not as though while transurban are making a killing, they'll probably take offence to that. They're making a killing. Yeah. Okay, but we, the trucking industry has not had the ability. This is not a new one for me, you know. It's been, I've been bombarded with. You've never been able to get back your toll cost. No. You know, you dare ask for it and someone else is going to take the job. Yeah. And they're going to well, even worse than that. Now, Glenn, have a look at the, uh, the Westlink, is it, in Sydney. Now we are going to be forced off. If, if we dare drive down Penadil, Road, which we've been driving down for a thousand years, we will now be t- when once kicked off back. The, once yep. the new tunnels open, mm, mm, forced into it. Yeah, yeah. And there'll be so you've got no choice, yeah. but to use the toll road. So, Gordo, with the time we've got in the Senate, Rennick, well, you please jump in. But there are many, many issues as we discussed, and yes. through through the representation of the NRFA at our transport industry standard forums, we've spent a lot of time. You know, the biggest problem I see is, is cost recovery. That's yep. pretty simple. But there are so many other challenges that you and your members face, and payment terms yep. has been one of them. Do you want to make some comment on that, mate? Yeah. Look, payment terms, you know, vary from. You know, most most of the stuff that I do is 30 days from the end of the month. So if you, you do a job at the start of the month, you know, 60 days later now, you've got to pay for your fuel before that and, you know, your driver wants to be paid and all the rest of it. You know, you make truck payments, insurance and everything else. So just to get into the, the job, you know, you've got to have quite a lot of money just to soak up until you start to get some money back. I'll give you a great example. I, I bought my first truck. And uh, I had $25,000 behind me, like once we were all in, ready, set to go. And uh, I had the truck for 10 days and blew the motor to pieces. $25,000 later, I rang my wife up and said, blew the motor up last night. She says, you're joking. I said, no, it's not the sort of thing I joke about, you know. So that $25,000 got eaten up straight away. And, uh, you know, that was that's part of being in business. Welcome to the hard, hard world, you know, that that's it. But... You, it takes, we, you, you never really sort of re- recover from that sort of thing, you know, and because you're, you're running on the, on the, the, you know, the skin of your teeth the whole time to try and, you know, get by. Good. I've heard examples and I, and I won't mention not, I'd love to disgrace the companies, absolutely, and expose them for, for their shocking behaviour, but I don't want to give up the transport companies, but boy, I've got evidences of 60, 90, 120, and one of the latest ones, 150 day payments. Yeah. Yeah. yeah how many times, how many of your members could survive on 60, uh-huh. 90? No. 120, 150 days. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I had a, we did uh, work for a, a company a couple of months ago in Canberra, actually, and uh, it was uh, two loads we did. And um, geographically, it was handy for where we were at the time. And we, we grabbed the loads, whatever. And I, um, we took the loads, and then I, you know, we were going to do it anyway. We, we, we were there. We needed to, to work out of that area. The work was there. So we, we did it, you know. And I said, look, you know, what are the payment terms? And that, that 60 days from the end of the month, you know. So from I mean, the end of the month? From the end of the Which month. Which could be 90 days. Yep, exactly. And I think it was actually at the start of the month when we yeah. did the job too. Mm-hmm. So, I, look, I, I did it. I took it. And I said to... It was one of my tow haulers. We were working together on it. And I said, yeah, he's... He's no longer on our list. We do not work for him. So I, I, I will make that stand and just not work for him. That's where some of the uh, the multinationals get you is they'll pay you faster, you know, but then they their rate is ordinary, you know. Sure. So um, and, and got another couple of things I do want to cover with you while we've got you here. Um, and, 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 of course, one of them uh, is the... Uh, sorry, I just want to come back on the, on the payment terms again once more. Uh, there's been a push, as you're well aware, uh, ATA are, are, are pushing on this, and I know Nat Rose are, are yeah. upfront about this sort of stuff on the 30-day payments. I want to commend... I hear this, I'm going to get condemned by a lot of my mates out there. I want to commend an announcement in the Senate by me, uh, Senator Cash the other day, and correct me, Senator Rennick, I may, if I've missed out a bit, but anyone doing work in the defence space um, for the government, any contractors and all that, long as they get their invoice via email or electronic, will be paid in five days, I think I heard, which I think fantastic. And I'd love to say to Minister Cash, move it over. Let's go to every industry. So for a minute, because I'm the old-fashioned one, I believe it's cash on delivery, but the worst I'll copy is seven days. That's yep. not the real world. Yep. So let's go back to the NRFA. What's your members' position? Would you support the likes of what the ATA and Nat Roads are doing for legislating 30-day payment systems? Some, some federal government 
intervention, and I know that does upset a few of my colleagues when we use that word. I would say it like this, Glenn. I would, and I think I could speak on behalf, I would personally, and I believe most of my uh, constituents would support a payment terms, and I'm not going to say I support 30 days or I support 7 days or I support 20 minutes. But there needs to be, just like with the rates, a, a, a proper... There needs to, it needs to be looked into to say, what is right? I don't know. Like, like I, I'm not here today with the answer saying sure. X, Y, Z equals no. a perfect industry. But we need to have many things looked at, and that is certain payment terms is just part of your, your payment, you know. So that, that yep. that's, a, that's a big thing. And Senator Rennick, please jump in if you any time, and I know you will. So, so look, thanks, Gordon. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock because don't we got to, we've got. I've got a couple other things that no, I'd I like want to you bring to. Up. Yeah, I yeah. Now you bring them up, then yeah. I want to raise something else with you. Okay, there's there's another thing that the National Road Freighters Association are working on in the background, and we're having a bit of trouble getting traction with it, I guess. Um, and it is um, the cost to register a vehicle, a, a heavy vehicle, so a prime mover is if you do single trailer work, it's about 6000 to $6,500 a year. And if you do multi-trailer work, you're looking at double that. So if, if depending on your location and everything else, unless you're New South Wales, of course, and then you can throw another $2,000 at it. I'd rip it down here, that's what I was going to ask you. Yep. So, okay. so, yeah. so <clears throat> the National Road Freighters Association have... And, I'll say this, please put me on the record for saying this, a single trailer running the East Coast, I'm happy, I won't say I'm not happy, but I'll accept to pay $6,000, $6,500, because the vehicle's doing $220,000 a year, whatever. What I won't accept, and is, and is daylight robbery, is if I don't do 220,000 kilometres in that vehicle, and I just want to have so I can provide a safe platform for my drivers and I might have, say I've got 10 trucks and we've got an old truck that we just, you know, we just retired. It's worth nothing to sell, but it's still safe. We put it through the workshop and we spend 20,000 bucks on it. We refurbish it and that vehicle is in pristine condition. It's very, very safe. And we would like to have it sitting there so that our other drivers, when their vehicles need a service, they can jump in this truck and take it to Melbourne and we can keep their truck and keep their truck safe and well maintained. And that truck might do one trip a week, you know. It might do one trip a month. It might do one trip a year. Or maybe you only use it in the grain harvest season when, you know, you, you, you're flat out for, for a month or two months and then it gets parked up. We still have to pay $13,000 a year to register that truck. Now, that's absolutely crazy. So... And why does it cost twice as much to register the prime mover that's pulling two trailers as, as one? Now, you may or may not re recall, but several years ago, the, the price to register a single trailer is about, from memory, I think it's about $1,600 a year, $1,800 a year. If you go back five or six years, the A trailer, so, you know, the, the A trailer fits under the, it's the front trailer and then the B trailer sits on that. The A trailer can carry 12 pallets, say, and the back trailer can carry 22 pallets. There are variations of both those, but that's the industry normal. So in the uh, governments of the country, and it's a, and I agree, in fact, it's a state thing, you know, but they're all on the same page. It used to cost you $4,000 a year to register your front trailer. Now, hang on, you might recall, I just told you that it carries 12 pallets. The back one carries 22 pallets. That's $1,800 saying this one used to be $4,000. And and if you ask, what, what's the go with that? Do you know what the, the reason for that I'm was? I'm interested to hear what the answer is. The reason for that was, Glenn, believe it or not, they were, the, the governments were trying to encourage um, well, how did they word it? It was to encourage efficiency in the transport industry. So what they were saying was, because that'll only carry 22, we're going to penalise you. Don't think, oh, hang on, it, instead of carrying 22, it now carries 34, because you've actually added 12 to it. 
So we, we fought that battle and finally now it costs you the same amount to register that one as, as that one. So that's a good thing. So what the National Road Traders Association are saying, let's drop all this, you know, it costs $13,000 to register that because once a month you might pull a B-double and you need to be able to do that so you've got to have it registered to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's all in your, it's, it's nothing to do with the vehicle and the way it's manufactured, it's the way you register it. So. When you go to the RMS or Vic Roads, wherever you register it, and you say, I want to register this for single trailer operation, and they say, great, hand us 6000 bucks, and you can do that. You go to them and you say, I want to handle, register this for multi-combination work, and they go, great, hand us twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000, and you can do the same thing. So what we are saying is, when a vehicle's parked in the shed, or out in the paddock, or wherever, it's not destroying your roads, it's not doing anything but sitting in a shed, why is it costing us, you know, such a huge amount of money to have that thing sitting there all the time? So what we're saying is, let's let's drop the the registration of, of trucks to say we've used a nominal fee of uh, of say uh, five hundred dollars a year. I don't care if it's going to pull fourteen trailers in, you know, Kununurra, mm. or it's going to pull a twenty foot you know, container around Melbourne, I don't care. It's going to cost you $500 a year to register now. You're probably sitting there thinking, oh, we've just lost a heap of money. No, what we want to do is we want to recover that money when we fuel up at the Bowser. So none of us want to pay more money for fuel, but what we are saying is, and, and I, I think off the top of my head, the calculation was about five cents a litre. So under the system that we're proposing, if you're doing... We, we keep using the East Coast single trailer as the as the the, the sort of benchmark where we're at now. We we will agree to keep paying the same amount as it's costing us to do that. And that's I think works out the top of my head, I think it's about five cents a litre. Now, if you're stinking heavy and you're burning more fuel, you're paying more rego, but you know what, you're actually damaging more more to the road. Mm. So that's fair enough. Yep. If you've got four trailers swinging out the back, you're burning a heap of fuel and you're doing more damage to the road, so you pay more rego. But if you have that spare truck so your drivers can be safe and you park it up and it doesn't do much most of the year, it's not burning fuel, you're not paying rego. If you decide, heaven forbid, that you've somehow managed to scrape enough money up to go on holidays with your family for the week, you're not paying rego. Isn't that a fairer system? It's know? starting to gain a bit of uh, traction too. I noticed in the media a couple of days ago, now there's the, the fluffy, the... Yep. Stirring up the uh, road user charge yep. argument, Gordo. So it's, I do want you to carry on. I read the paper. Tony gave me the paper to read, and I read it on the plane back from yep. Rocky to Melbourne that night. And could you um, provide that to the committee? Yes, I please. Can, I'll, I'll get. I'll lot. get a. I can email a copy through. I'll get George, my secretary, yeah. to do that. Yeah. I mean, I can find a copy and, and yeah, yeah, no, distribute. That's fine. I'd rather yep. you put it through to the secretariat so that yep. senators themselves can have a read because yeah, it's sure. now gaining traction. Yeah. And the problem with that, so I think uh, Rod said it earlier. You know, common sense is when we start mm -hmm. implementing that gets a little bit hard to work out. But if there is push from the industry to say, "Hey, there's a better way." Yep. It's very hard to say no, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I know the cash grab up the front of all that. Yeah. So and and I, I hate to sit here today and look like we're a pack of whingers, but what we are, we're, we're an industry that's in absolute crisis at the moment and we're screaming out for help. And luckily, you're, you're asking us for our opinion. So that's another one. And there's another one, another issue which is uh, a very, well, it's, it's similar, and this is another thing I tried to do when I was with Nat Road and didn't gain traction, but. So I'm going to use some examples. So we've got the, the there's many many variations of combinations in Australia used, but I'm going to give you two examples which I'm going to just say they're the industry standard. And, and what I mean by that is, 90% of them uh, are these configurations. So we've got in in single trailer uh, format, we've got a 22 pallet uh, trailer. So. 19 metres long for the whole combination, 22 pallet. Yep. That's that's pretty standard. On B doubles, we've got 34 pallet standard combination. Now, if you go down to the the Kenworth dealer there, this is going to probably surprise you. Go down to the Kenworth dealer, say, or or whoever you, you your preferred choice is. 
and you say, you know, I would like a prime mover that's um, that will comply with a 45-foot trailer and I want as much living room as I can because I live in the truck and I want to be safe and I want to be able to rest properly and I want to be able to, you know, enjoy my life on the road. And they say, yeah, no problem. And in the case of Kenworth, they'll say to you, you know, you can have this truck here with a bonnet and it's got a 50-inch bunk, which 50 inches to live in is still not a lot, but you know what, that's actually that's actually considered big in Australia. I've got friends in America that they they get a 50-inch, like, how do you live in that thing? Like, they can't believe it. They hear, they have 70 inches is, is, is considered the bare minimum, you know, they'll put up with it sort of thing. So most people in Australia are, are living in a 36 inch, that's three foot, that's not even a metre. That is our living, and in that area you've got your bed and your cupboard, whatever else you need to have to, to, to put into that, right? So let's say you're, you're lucky enough, you can't a single trailer like the, the, my truck that I just sold was, had the 50 inch set up and it was, it was full length. On the uh, on the on the single trailer, 45 footer, its maximum weight I could attain in, under that system with with mass management was 43 and a half ton. The the truck was uh, was uh, rated to 90 tons, so beautiful. We got all that covered. We got plenty up our sleeve, no problem there. And I'm at the maximum length, no problem. So you'd think, if you had common sense, this is. A 34 pallet B-double is the industry standard. So we've got, so that truck fits on the 22 pallet single trailer standard, right? Yep. So now we're moving in. I, I say, you know what? Things are looking pretty good. The customers are, are, are going well, you know. I've got extra freight. I'm going to put, you know, put a B-double together and, and cart an extra 12 pallets, you know. So that's the standard yep. now. Guess what? That $350,000 truck that fits perfectly on your 19 meter single doesn't fit by the law, that's ridiculous. because some dapey mongrel, and yeah. I'm sorry, that's what they were, yeah. decided that, no, nah, there's sweat path and all this other rubbish that you've got to yeah. go through, and, and we're saying, no, nah, and so the, the truck is a foot too long. It won't fit. So we're going to make you live now in a cab over truck, which Rod drives, mm. which in my opinion is dangerous. You go to America and see how many cab over trucks, you see none, because they've learned that they're dangerous. When you have an accident in a cab over truck, unfortunately, you're the first one at the scene. You know, there is nothing in between you and what happens. They're dangerous. You know, the, the governments of Australia have forced, they've forced the Australian transport industry into the use of cab over trucks. If you look at Packard, Packard uh, owned Kenworth in Australia and DAF and Peterbilt in America and whatever. And so I went to the truck show in Louisville and Kentucky last year and uh, to have a bit of a look around. You know what? I could not find a single cab over. cab over truck in that truck show anyway. They don't they don't make them. They don't no one wants them. They're dangerous. In my opinion they're dangerous. There's a lot of bikes out there that will shoot me down and say, I love the cab over and they're great. No worries. You should have the choice. So now what we're saying is my business was restricted. The whole time I had that truck, I could not go to a thirty four pallet V double configuration because of some stupid law that said we've got two standards of trailers, a, a single and a B-double, and that same prime mover won't fit. How ridiculous so, so is that? So you've got a, I mean, this is, you know, I shake my head because you know, you'd like to think this is just the dream, bad dream you're going to wake up and, yeah. and you're, you know, you're sipping something out of a, a big glass with an umbrella under it and you're only having a bad dream. Unfortunately, it's harsh reality. Is this any state in particular? Is it every state of Australia? Um, I believe Western Australia may be at 27 metres and there was talk for us. And, and so what I say is, and, and I'll go back a little bit. So when I, I first, I'm relatively new to transport. I've only been in it for about 15 years. Um, when you, when I first got in it, B-doubles, so when, when B, we'll go back even further. B-doubles when they first came out were 23 metres over, certainly on the east coast. I'm not sure about the west. Then they went to 25 metres. And 25 metres you could, you couldn't get a 34 pallet B double combination on any monitored truck practically. And 34 pallet was what everyone was sort of, you know, trying to aim for. And there were boys getting around with 32 pallet setups. And what happens then is you, you go to find freight and every load is for, is for 20, you know, it's for, a, uh, it, it's for 34 pallets. 34, yes. Not 32. Yeah. So they, the customer says, no, sorry, mate, I can't, can't load you. So you, you, you're inviolable. You can't, survive. So 
we eventually talked the government into giving us 26 metres. And what happened then was the multinational said, well, hang on, what we'll do here, fellas, is we're going to take that 34 pallet set up, we're going to move the kingpin here, we're going to move these axles forward, we're going to get all, because we've got this thing called X, Y, Z theory, you've got to have all your axles have got to be, you've got to know all your measurements and everything, you, you're not only got to worry about your fatigue and your driving and everything else, you've actually got to worry about how many centimetres it is from your back axle group to your middle axle group to your front axle group and all this rubbish, which is all, it is what it is, is rubbish. We know what we're doing, let's just go and do our job. So they said, yep, we'll give you 26 metres. So many of the big companies in this city here today, that some of these people will be here today, no doubt, they all jumped on board and said, yep, no dramas. 36 pallets set up. We get an extra two pallets, so we'll cart for nothing. And we'll do it for cheaper. Yeah, we'll do it for nothing, then, because we just want to work. So instead of giving the poor old driver a decent place to rest and sleep and live, we'll, we'll, we'll still keep him cooped up in that tiny little truck. And, you know, we're going to get an extra... What is that in the percentage? About 4% for eight. We'll, we'll get an extra 4% in there. And the driver can go to buggery. Buggery, he doesn't need anything, you know. Mm. So it's been very, very poorly done over the years. Every time there's an amendment to the, to the configurations, it's done for the freight companies, not the driver. And it's about time the driver got looked after, I believe. Yeah. And that, that, is a, that is a huge issue, especially yeah. when you've got the impulse of fatigue and yeah. we're away from home and away from our families. Yeah. God of mine, we don't know what we're doing until the last minute half the time. I, I've just been, probably, I've been a little bit distracted. I've, my driver, I don't know what he's doing yet, and I, I've sort of had a little hope. Of, I've just got a laid luckily come in. I've got a good customer. She's looking if after If you me. need a couple of seconds yeah, to just that, do that, Gordo. Just sing out and we'll suspend to yeah, it. Yeah, no, that's fine. Thank you. That's fine. So, Gordo, look, with the time we've got going, you've, you've covered off on a number of very important issues and we've gone through the cost recovery rates and the guy <laughs> office, we're not allowed to mention, mention the word profit. I'll mention profit every time I open my gob. Yep. We've talked about payment terms as a big issue and I know there is not three or four things we can fix in this mm. industry. There's, there's heaps. We know that all layers of government don't talk to each other. We know that the... The, um, uh, unfortunately, governments refuse to, to talk to the transport operators from simple things like truck bays to lengths and, and bunks and all that. What other issues have you, would you, you wish to raise on behalf of the NRFA that this committee needs to take into consideration when forming a report, mate? And I know that you'll talk about training and I know you'll, you can talk about all sorts of things. I'll make a one-sentence one comment on training. Can we please get... Well, it might be more than one sentence, but one comment. Can we please get some training involved in an apprenticeship system? And I don't know, once again, I don't have the answer for you today, but waiting for a bloke to be 22 years of age to decide to come and drive trucks, he's he's gone. He's yep. doing something else by then. We need to get kids at 17, 18 involved. Let's stop banning kids from being on site with their parents when they're in the truck on school holidays, we need that because that's how you get good truck operators. And I think if I can on that too, so the community understands that there is a group now working that was for, was democratically elected off the floor from the uh, Transport Industry Standards Forum that are now yep. raising this with Minister Cash. And Minister Cash was very generous with her time in Canberra last week and met with them under the leadership of John West from Queensland. And this is an old thing, you know, all of us learned at the hip of our old mm. man. You're still yeah, alive, Glenn. Yeah. So, so it couldn't have been that bad. You can't take yeah. a kid on the road <laughs> on school holidays or something. Yeah, well, even, even I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a little silky terrier, beautiful little dog, little Brocky. I lost him here last year, unfortunately. But he used to come everywhere from me in the truck. Beautiful little fellow. Yeah, because it's actually a bit lonely out there. Yeah, And it was yeah. so nice having... I'm an I'm a animal lover, you know? Yeah. So little Brocky used to come everywhere with me. Now, I'd have to hide the little fellow because... He's in the. He's in my truck. That should be my territory. That's mine. That's nothing. He didn't get out and run around your depot or whatever. But a lot of places, if they knew you had that, you get kicked off site. You're not even allowed to be a human. That's serious. You are not allowed to be a human being in this industry. You just got to be some machine that they turn on and off, and say you will sleep now, you will drive now, you will do this, you will do that. But just back to taking your own kids. Like, surely that's a free world, isn't it? Well, what, it, it is until, the, until the, the multinationals say, you know what, no, you can't do this. And what they is don't, that because what they don't realise... Is more workers' comp or something, is it? Well, they, 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 they think they're under risk and all that, and I get that. But surely in the, in, in the sanction of our cab, that should be... Uh, that's us. Yep. That should have nothing to do at all with anything. And if you want to get good... 
if you want good operators, and I tell you now, we've got like a 15 or 20 year window where we're going to struggle because that's that's what we've done for the last 15, 20 years. We've said, no, Dad can't take, you know, little Johnny on his school holidays. I mean, I've, my kids have been lucky. I've done a lot of that over here. I've hidden them in bunks. And, you know, little Brocky, he'd be, we'd be loading somewhere, he'd be stinking hot. I'd be outside in 45 degrees load, and I'd have him in the cab with the ice pack running, he'd be kicking back on the bed with the cool vent blowing on him, you know, like loving life. That's what you do, you know, your kids or your, or you, like, why can't you have a pet with you? I mean, yeah. we're humans. We, we're away a lot. We need that, you know. Mm. It's like, we just get treated like subhumans so much. How do you yeah. get on with workers' comp if you're going from Brisbane to Melbourne, three states? Okay. Who do you, how do you manage your workers' comp? Because um, it's by state by state. I think it goes on the state that your business is based in. That's a good question. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you something even better than that. I was talking to Glenn about this earlier on. So there was a tragedy last, uh, I, look, it might be a week or ten, probably ten days ago, there was a, it was a truck accident in Gundagai, just up the road here, yeah. not far from home. Um, and I, the work I do at the moment, day to day, I actually contract my time out to a larger transport company and look after the maintenance of a large fleet of theirs. That's yeah. uh, I, that's that's what I do. I don't drive as such. But yesterday I drove a BW yesterday as part of that. But day to day, that's not how I make my living. So you knock the rust off, mate, so you don't... Yeah, because, you know what, I just want to be home more. I, I just, I had this one day, I don't know, I actually went over to Perth and I got, and it was a bloody long trip, loved every minute of it, and I got back and I said, you know what, there's more to life than this. And and yeah. so I got out of the, the, the driving duties. I'm still in transport, but I don't drive it as such. So, you know, the other day there was, uh, so in the workshop where I, where I work, one of the blokes fell in the pit. We have a pit that you park the truck over to work on the trucks, you know, and he was injured, so there was a, a, a work safe, um, uh, you know, investigation, I suppose. And so we had one of the officers come, and I've got to say, he was very good to deal with. It was, you know, no, he just they at the end of the day wanted to make sure this doesn't happen again. Picked up a couple of little things in the workshop, but generally we were, we were pretty happy with how it all went. So anyway, in the course of the conversation, I get talking to this gentleman and. Uh, and he he said, oh, you know, I've had a busy you know, busy couple of days. He said, oh, I had to go to uh, go up the Gundy guy and investigate the uh, accident there the other day where the uh, road worker lost his license. And I said, oh, hang on, sorry, what? Who, you know, I'm, I'm misunderstood you there. And he said, well, there was a, a a road worker, I believe. This is what I believe happened. A road worker there on the stop and go or whatever, and. Uh, Unfortunately, during the course of that accident and the clean-up and whatever, he had his life taken in, in an accident, which is horrible. So don't get me wrong, absolutely. You know, that is that shouldn't happen. Should not happen. But he was there partaking in the clean-up of a heavy vehicle accident where, guess what? A heavy vehicle driver lost his licence. There is no investigation into that man losing his licence. His, sorry, his, did I say licence? His, his, his you life. said licence, yeah, no, no. My, my apology. There's no investigation into him losing his life because it is not deemed that he's at work. When he's travelling on the highways, he, it's a road death. It's not road, a work road safe sick, yeah. thing. We don't get investigated. When we die at work, we don't get investigated as a work accident. It is a road accident. Right. I'll give you another little, just a, another a thing here. Uh, now, these figures are maybe two or three years old, but they're figures that I always remember. Road transport, well, no, sorry, heavy vehicles in New South Wales, so think about these figures. Heavy vehicles in New South Wales make up 7% of all traffic movement, right? So if you look at the total kilometres that vehicles do on the roads in New South Wales, public roads, 7% of those kilometres are done by heavy vehicles, okay? So just think about that. Mm. When there's a fatality on a road, Heavy vehicles are at fault and cause that fatality on 3.3% of occasions. So less than half of our representation in our total representation on the road, when there's a fatality, and no one wants to die, I don't want to ever see anyone die on the road. It's shocking. But we are less than half represented. Now, how many blitzes do you see? When was the last time you drove down the road and were blitzed? by having to, you know, get pulled over and, and checked everything about you. 
right through, go through your sleeping compartment and treat you like a drug addict. Yeah. I've never taken an illegal drug in my life. I've done three, three million kilometres in trucks. I've never taken an illegal drug in my life because I had to always come home and look my kids in the eye and that's the way I operated. I'll tell you, I've bent a lot of rules, absolutely. I had to do that because that's the way the system forces yeah. you to operate. It does. But I've also been, I've been accused by, by law enforcement officers that I must have drugs hidden in the truck somewhere and my whole truck stripped apart. That's my house. That's where I live, man. They don't do that to drug dealers. They don't. And well, here's another one. How many often do you read, you pick up, you know, we're in Auburn, you pick up the border mail and you read, the, you know, what's happened and someone's been done for some drug offence or whatever and they've been fined, you know, $300 or whatever. And you look, some poor bloke went down the road and he forgot to sign his logbook while he was carrying, you know, the stuff that you're going to need tomorrow at the supermarket and he loses a half a week's wages. Mm -hmm. You know, what Rod said before, we're the only industry that gets punished for doing overtime. Now, I'm not saying we need to, and I don't think Rod was saying that we need to be able to do as many hours mm -hmm. as we want. Yeah, right. But the um, if I've got one time for one more thing. I'm just checking for you, mate, that's all. I'm, I'm good, I'm going to hang well, out all got day. Pod, don't we've got pod, yeah. So what, one other thing, um, <clears throat> on the and another thing I've tried to be involved in with some of the work that I do is the hours of service, I'll call it. So the logbook laws, whatever, hours of service is what I like to call it. We're all adults. You have to be an adult to be old enough to drive a truck. I know when I need to sleep. I don't need someone else to tell me when I need to sleep. Yes, I fully accept that we uh, need to have a cap on how many hours we do a day. And you work out whether it's 14 hours or 12 hours or whatever. But give us total flexibility to do it when we can do it, when we need to do it. Because no one else works with us. No one else lets us... Um, you know, we go to load and, and it takes four hours to do what should take an hour. And that puts us behind. And then all of a sudden, exactly what happened to Rod last night, he had plenty of hours left in, in the actual hours in the day. But because he started at seven o'clock in the morning, he, he couldn't, you know, he, he had to be off the road by a certain time, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we're just put under so much pressure. Let, let us, we know when we know, no one, no one wants to do these stupid, stupid hours. We just need to be able to have a, a, a bit of fr flexibility. And, you know, I can tell you we're taking the flexibility now. Most people will do it, they, but they risk a fine, whatever, to do it. Because at the end of the day, you've got to get the job done. I don't, you don't want to be coming into Melbourne and have to go out the Dandenong, which if you don't know is out, out the far side of Melbourne. So if you, if you come into Melbourne at, you know, at, at one o'clock in the morning and you don't need to deliver that until, say, nine o'clock the next morning, but your logbook tells you that, you know, you've got to stop. So so you stop, but you might have only done nine or ten hours of actual work for the day, but just because when you started compared to what the time is now, the logbook tells you you've got to stop. So all of a sudden in the morning, you you wake up in the morning. Well, it's the first thing that happens in Melbourne in the morning. I don't know if you've ever been there, but the traffic is horrendous. Mm. So you, you're straight into traffic. So you're adding to congestion. You're adding to the carbon footprint of the transport industry because instead of being efficient and burning less fuel to get across town at 1 o'clock in the morning, you stop, start, all that. You get flustered. And it just adds to your day, and it goes on day after day after day. But you're losing that extra time too, coming off the end of the day. Yeah. Where you could have scooted the cross in 40 minutes, you'd yep. two hours. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, my, my Toby, he is great. He will never, ever drives out of hours, ever. He, and he's never asked to. I tell him, mate, you go to bed. I don't care. You tell me when you're going to be in the morning, and that's great. And and he he does it that way, you know, and that that works it work, works fine for I think it's important if I may to sort of explain so so the community understands this too. When you say flexibility, and I've heard stories because um, we didn't have fatigue management when I was on the road okay, yep. um, in WA, but I've heard stories with truck drivers 30 minutes from home, but the book says thou shall pull up now. Thou yep. shall not be allowed to go that extra yep. 30 minutes to get to uh, your yep. own shower, your bed, your toilet and your yep. family. And I think what people need to, when, when people say that they're 30 minutes from home, a lot of people will, because it's not reported correctly, will, will say, well, you know, you've already done your hours. No, you might not. You might have driven five hours for the day, but because you started at seven o'clock in the morning, that means at midnight you've got to be finished. So you, you might have, you might have got up at seven, 
driven to where you're unloading and they've made you wait for five hours and then you, you've done what you've done there and then you had to go across town mm. so you've worked another hour and then you wait three hours for them to do what they do and then at midnight you might have only worked for seven hours in your logbook and, and as Glenn says, it says, no, you've got to stop now. And tell us the drama. What happens, hypothetically, and it's always dangerous to talk hypothetically, but what would happen if the logbook said stop and the driver said, I'm not stopping, I'm half an hour, and then got caught? Well, if you, that, that'd be a major, if you're over at the end of your day, that's a, that's a major breach, you go to court. Yeah. And? Uh, well, you could well, yeah, lose a week's wages or more, lose your licence, lose your livelihood. Okay. You know, and then you've got to go and face your, your partner, your wife, your husband, your kids, and say, you know what, I, I, I can't earn an income now. And, and that's hard to believe in 2019, this is yeah. actually law. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a and long time. Yeah. if it means there's technology around that can help us with whether, whether people are tired, I don't know whether we need that or not, but if we've got to have it, then okay, that's something we can look at. But you know what, I just think, yeah. let, let us be adults and let us be mature and let us make a decision. I mean... I, I think there's nothing wrong with pulling up at. I'll give you a, a really good example. So, say you come out, say you come out of Melbourne and you're heading to Sydney, and you, you look at your watch when you leave Melbourne. You go, I'm going to have a half hour break at Holbrook. I'll run in home. I'm going to have a shower. Uh, hope my wife is going to have tea ready for me. And I've done this in and out and gone in half an hour. Like say go to the kids, and it's it's terrible when you got to do it. But there are nights yep. when you do it, and your trucking family understand that. Yep. So you bang, you're in and out in half an hour. Done. And you know that you're going to get to, you know, say you're going to Ingleburn in Sydney and I'm, I'm going to make it. I'm going to have about 10 minutes spare at Ingleburn. Beauty. All done. I can do it all legal. And I will have worked for 10 hours for the day and I can actually do 14. So I've got four that I haven't used, but whatever. And then you get to Goulburn and you think, oh, geez, I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit tired. I just wouldn't mind having half an hour in the bunk. But you know, if you pull up and have that half an hour in the bunk, you're not going to make it Ingleburn legally. So you'll get past the last camera. So do you, do you run the risk there or whatever? Why aren't we supported by, we're an essential service. Why aren't we supported and, and, and saying, hey guys, if you need flexibility, you need to pull up half an hour. We're not going to penalise you at the end of the day because you pulled up and were safe. So what, what, and this is why you see trucks on the well, side of it. How, how does it work? Sorry for ignorance. Yeah, no, no. If you pulled up for half an hour, why doesn't that come off your time? So what it is at the start of the day, whenever you start your... your so it doesn't your, take into account rest stops? Yeah, it does. So oh. so the a really broad overview, if you... Um, there's, there's, a couple, there's three different fatigue systems you can run under, but under standard hours, you can do 12 hours in a day, uh, and that's so when you start your day at the end of your long rest break they call it so you've got to have a minimum 70 hour rest break and then you've got to be careful if you started late one day and you worked your, your 12 hours so say you drove 5 hours so say you started at uh, say you start, let's say you start at midnight to make it easy and you drove for 5 hours you had half an hour off you drove for 5 hours you had half an hour off it's now 11 o'clock in the morning and you've got 2 hours left so you drive for two hours, it's now one o'clock in the afternoon. You now have to stop for nine hours, not seven hours, because if you stop it for seven, which you've got to have a minimum seven hour break in every 24 hour period, right. but because you've already burned 12 hours in that last 24 hour period, you've got to take that into account. Now, if you split that up during the day and you had half an hour here and you stop for 15 minutes there, you've got to have a computer in your hand that can work out whether you're on overlap, so you don't want to like you've, you've got two periods running at once. So we've got to take all this into account as well as what the axle weights and how much fuel we've got left and all the other gazillion things going on in our head at the same time. We just need something really, really simple in place where in any 24 hour period, you can do, you tell us how many hours, you say 12 hours or 14, I believe it should be 14. Tell us how many hours we can do. And then we, uh, we, we, we manage to, we, we do that ourselves. We say, yep, we're going to, um, we're going to pull up now because we're tired and then we're going to get going again when we, we feel rested. But if we feel like having three hours sleep, then have three hours sleep. Now, to the normal person pulling up and having three hours sleep, they think, well, just go to bed. Well, you know, people do this job because we're all different. We don't all need eight hours sleep a day and everyone's a bit different everyone operates differently some people like to have a nap in the afternoon sure. some people like to drive all night some people will do it like the, the, the normal 
citizen that doesn't drive a heavy vehicle will do it and go to bed at night and whatever. But let's give us the flexibility to do it when, when we need to do it and when it fits in with... At the end of the day, we're, we're also trying to run a business or, or do a job for someone who's running a business. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's it's still important to, to have an... Ec- to have the economy running and, sure. and transport's a big part of it. And I think this is going to be a huge part of our inquiry too. Good, I'm so sorry to cut you off, mate, no, because no. we are running out of time. You saw me flicking through the phone. I wasn't checking up here. I want to show you a photo yeah, yeah. of something that snapped in America when we talk about bunks, mate. Yeah, I yeah. Myself. That'll nearly get me back on the road. So yeah. I wasn't being rude. I just want to show you this photo so we don't lose. Yeah. Can I, good, I can I thank you very much mm-hmm. on behalf of the committee to you and the NRFA for availing yourself. And I know the, the hours you put in the conversations you and I have had over the month can only continue because we've got to do something to improve this industry. We can't leave it in this state.